Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to Inglebard Gaming. For those of you who are new around here, this is the third episode in my tutorial series that will teach you how to make music on the Sega Genesis using Deflamask. Needless to say, if you're watching this now and haven't seen the primer or the first two episodes in the series yet, you'll want to check those out first or you'll be totally lost here. They're all linked in the description. If you're here thanks to my retro gaming videos, well don't worry, I'll be back to those right after this one. If you're here for the tutorial, then let's march on! Like last time, I won't bore you with a long preamble here, I'll just tell you what we're covering and then dive right in. I'll start with a brief recap of what we covered in the first two episodes, just for a minute or so. After that, we'll get into making a few more types of FM instruments. I'm going to go through them a little faster this time, so if you want to see the settings used in each one, just go ahead and pause the video while those are on screen. I'll also show you another little FM instrument cheat sheet that covers a few more common instrument types that you might want to use. After that, for the final part of the episode, I'll get you started with effects. I'm not going to cover each and every effect. I'm going to go over the basics of how they work and show you what are probably the most commonly useful ones. Keep in mind you can see a complete list of effects and how they work in the Deflamask manual and you can actually see them on screen if you're using the updated commercial version of Deflamask. Speaking of that current paid version, hey, I've got 10 more copies to give away for your operating system of choice. I'll tell you how to win them later in the video. Alright, let's get on with it. Here's a quick review of what I covered in the first two episodes. In episode 1, I went over the very basics of Deflamask. What it is, the components of its interface, what various settings and parameters mean, and so on. I also walked you through how to use the program to enter notes, and we made a fun little intense version of Mary Had a Little Lamb to finish things off. In the last episode, I covered most of the menus for the major tasks that you'll be completing on a regular basis. We looked at everything in both the free legacy version of Deflamask and the equivalents in the current paid version of Deflamask. I also covered hexadecimal numbers, which will come in handy later in today's episode. Then we got to some real business, and I showed you how to create a few decent common instrument types and taught you a little trick with the delay effect ED. So last time I covered making several instrument types. Pipe organ, a brassy trumpet type sound, and a couple of different piano sounds. Obviously I can't show you how to do every type of instrument or we'd be here forever. So I'll look at a few more common ones that you might want to use. Today we'll look at some guitars, some basses, a xylophone or vibraphone type instrument, and just a few others. Let's kick this off with an acoustic guitar. Here are the settings for one I've already made. Feel free to pause here and match up the settings in Deflamask on your own. Got them? Great! Now let's set the octave to 4 and play a few notes in the QWERTY row. Sounds pretty decent, I think. I used this or one similar to it in the cover of the song Undertale from the game Undertale! Now you might think it sounds a little simple, so I'm going to show you something else that's a little more intermediate now. If we use more than one sound channel, we can create a nice little effect of notes overlapping and leading from one right into the other. So check it out. If I use just one channel to play this sequence of notes, it sounds like this. But listen to what it sounds like if I expand it to two channels and then alternate each note in each of those channels. Pretty big difference, huh? We could even do it with three channels. As long as you have enough open sound channels, this is an awesome way to do arpeggios with pluck style instruments. But let's say you don't like acoustic guitar. You're a metalhead. You want to see some straight up heavy metal distortion guitar. Well, check this one out. I'll keep the settings up for just a moment. Pause if you want to copy them. Now, listen to this. Pretty cool, right? The key here, as you might expect, is having a high level of feedback to create the distortion sound. You can play around in a few different algorithms to customize it a bit and make various aspects of it stronger. You still have to find the right balance using the total level in Operator 1, and depending on the algorithm you're in, possibly Operator 2 as well. 
There are so many ways to alter this that you'll really have to dial it in to the exact sound you want. Now let's move on to a Genesis specialty. Bass. The Genesis's YM2612 sound chip is really great at creating low, heavy, bassy sounds, so you can replicate a whole lot of different types of bass instruments pretty well. If you want something that sounds acoustic, you can do that. If you want a nice hard slap bass, hey, not a problem. If you want something softer or synthy, also very doable. I'll show you a few of them real quick here. So check out this first one, which is real similar to the one used in the SNES Final Fantasy IV battle theme. I actually made this one for my cover of that song that you can hear on my music channel. Here are the settings if you want to pause and match them up on your own Defla Mask. Now let's drop the octave to 2 for this one, and play some keys in the QWERTY row. Pretty nice, right? I recommend paying special attention to decay on this, because bass sounds that linger a little too long can give your song kind of a sloppy sound, where the bass kind of bleeds into the other instruments. Generally, you want to have a decently quick decay value on these, but obviously the sound you want will vary by the song. How about a slap bass? Here's an example of one of those. I'll leave it up for a moment again. Now, let's try it out. Well, not too shabby. You can tweak the sort of higher pitched twang you get from this by messing with the multiplier on one of the operators and making it much higher than the others. Just watch the TL so it doesn't overpower the lower sounds. For basses, you'll usually want three of the multipliers to be very low, either a 1 or a 2. And again, there are exceptions depending on what exactly you're working on. Now what if you want something a little more orchestral? Well, then you can sort of do something like this. This one would be of use in classical instrumental style music. Alrighty, I think we need a quick cat break. Is your brain cleansed yet? Then let's move on. Next up, I've got a pretty easy one for you. Here's a vibraphone style instrument. Once again, here are the settings and I'll hold them up for a moment. Now let's test it out. Well, that sounds pretty nice. And, sort of similar to what I showed you with the guitar a few minutes ago, you can use more than one channel to help emphasize the sound of these as long as you've got them open. And then we can use this as the basis and transform it into more of a xylophone. You really don't need to do a whole lot. Generally, just lower the decay and release so the sound doesn't linger as much. Make the attack maximum, which means lowering it all the way to the bottom of the slider, and that'll cause it to start immediately, giving you a nice hit at the beginning. And, well, there you go! Now let's look at one special class of instruments. They're sort of the bane of this kind of FM sound, and those are... stringed instruments. Things like string ensembles. String ensembles are really tough to reproduce on relatively simple FM chips, like the YM2612. You just can't quite mimic everything a real string sound does. With a lot of work, you can create some decent sounding strings, but man, expect lots of customization for different octaves, timbres, and stuff like that. To begin here, we really need to understand the principles of sound at work behind a string ensemble. So the key feature of strings is that they vibrate. A lot. So FMS and AMS are especially important here. We can use some additional effects in the actual tracker to help them along, and we'll look at those in just a few minutes. Now aside from that, strings are generally soft at the beginning, meaning they have a less aggressive attack rate. They generally sustain pretty hard, and decay and release a bit slowly. With all that in mind, check out this example. Let's set the octave to 4 and play a few notes. By itself, this sounds pretty decent, I think. What you might want to do with strings is create a couple of different instruments and use them together on separate channels to 
create one harmonious sound. Here's a second string ensemble that I made. Now, let's play that sequence again with both of these. It's still not perfect, but that sounds better, I think, than playing the first one just by itself. Now, strings have a lot of nuance, which is where the problem comes from for FM versions of strings. As I mentioned a moment ago, you'll probably need to create a few different versions to use at different octaves, and possibly even different versions depending on what other instruments are playing at any given time to help emphasize your strings. Strings can work in a number of different algorithms, and will help you dial in and specify the type of sound you want. For example, algorithms 2 and 5 will give you sort of a harder, sharper string sound like this. while well, algorithms 4 and 6 will allow you to do a more subtle, softer string sound like this. Probably the key thing for strings is to mix the multipliers and the operators so that you have some high and some low. Which ones will be which will vary depending on which algorithm you're using, and how high the string sound is that you're going for. Obviously, for deep low strings, you'll want to prioritize a couple of low multipliers, probably as low as zero and at least one of them, and then maybe one or two on the other operators. For mid-range strings, you'll probably want some multipliers of two, four, and eight in your operators. For high strings, you'll probably want the mults in your operators between four and twelve, and they'll generally sound best in multiples of 4. Sometimes multiplier 6 can work pretty well, too. The important things to think about here are what the real-life instruments you're trying to reproduce actually do to create sound. I know that sounds a little overgeneralized, but listen for how much they vibrate, how quickly the notes go from start to sustain and then decay, and listen for the subtle hints of a high sound coupled with a medium or low sound. These are the settings that you'll need to figure out and then apply to your operators in order to try and match them. Alright, that's probably about the toughest instrument type to deal with in FM, so with that out of the way, let's take another cat break. <laughs> that's one of my boys. Alright, let's handle that giveaway. So, as last time, I'm giving away 10 copies of Devil Mask. It'll be a little bit different this time than last time. The basic rules are the same, winners get one copy for your OS of choice, and the options are Windows, Mac, Linux, iOS, or Android. If you want a copy in the past, you're not eligible this time, not even for a different OS. Sorry. To enter this giveaway, just comment on this video and say exactly, I really want to win Defla Mask from Engelbard Gaming. It has to be that exactly. The first qualifying 10 comments I see will win. The process is the same as usual. You comment, I comment back telling you that you won, and to email me with your details. After I confirm your eligibility, I'll secure your copy from Delic and send it to your email address of choice. I expect these to be gone probably in the first 24 hours. So if you're looking at this episode more than a day after it posted, I would say check the description to see if I say whether they're all given away or not before you enter. Who knows, maybe someone who wins won't be eligible and a slot will open up later. But I'll add a note near the top of the description once they're all given away. And winners will allow me to use their username, and uh, if there's any real last names in there, I'll omit those. But I'll put the names in a future episode just so I can prove that I gave all these things away as promised. Okay, let's finish up this section by checking out just a few more type of instruments real quickly. Here's one version of a flute that I made. These tend to work best at higher octaves. You can definitely play with the multipliers to change up how it sounds. Changing the decay and release will change it from a nice echoey flute at lower numbers near the top to a really high quick peep style flute with numbers down at the bottom of the slider. Try adjusting those parameters and listen to the difference. And hey, here's a quick little tune that you may be familiar with.
And here's how the flute sounds if we make just a couple of quick modifications. Next up, here's a harpsichord that I made for my rendition of the Long Library song for the Sega Genesis version uh, that'll show up in Pigsy's Castlevania Symphony of the Night. No, it's not the most natural sounding harpsichord ever, but it is very similar to the one used in the PlayStation and Saturn games. Next up, here's a pluck style pizzicato string that I've used different versions of in a few of my Symphony of the Night covers. The key to a good version of this is using two channels to create sort of an echoey effect. And remember, not all instruments have to attempt to replicate real life ones in order to sound good. Just an example, here's a sound I made for the lead part of my Genesis cover of the Fillmore song from ActRaiser. It sounds pleasant by itself, but sounds really great when used with an echo track. The key thing with creating any of your own instruments is to experiment. Test it out, change a few things, test it out again, and just keep doing that until you get something that you like the sound of. Now that you know what these sliders do and how they operate, it should be a little bit easier to try and get the sound you're looking for out of things. After you get a good sound, record a few sequences, play them back, and see how everything comes together. While the music is playing, you can even adjust the operators in real time to see how it sounds when you change them. I'll just caution you that when you adjust the operators in real time while playback is happening, it usually raises the playback volume to max, turns off stereo, and some other things until you stop and then hit play again. And with that, I'm going to conclude the FM Instruments segment of this tutorial. While I could cover a lot more on FM Instruments, at this point you should know enough to be comfortable with playing around with the settings to create your own. And remember, you can always look at the instruments that come with Deflamask as a guide and modify them into your own unique sounds. And as I promised earlier, here's another mini cheat sheet like I did last time, with some unique instruments. Now remember, these are just suggestions to get you started. These are not absolutes. You've got to experiment on your own. I'd suggest grabbing a screenshot of this if you're on a computer for easy access in the future. Okay, time to jump into our next big topic. Effects. You've seen a few effects already in the prior episodes of this series, but today I'm going to explain them in a little more detail. First up, and I can't stress this enough, RTFM, guys. Seriously. No matter which version of Deflamask you're using, you can go to the manual and look at the system you're creating music for to see a list of its effects and parameters. And here's a secret. That's how I learned how to use them myself. Remember, Deflamask was my first tracker experience, so I'd never done anything like this before. Now, I did ask a few questions from time to time in the Deflamask Discord when there was something I didn't quite understand, but the manual is absolutely the best reference you'll have regarding what effects are and how they work. Also, in the current Deflamask, you can pull up the effects list right in the program, which is super helpful, because no matter how experienced you get with them, I can promise you at some point, you'll forget what one of them is or what the parameters do exactly. I know it's happened to me on more than one occasion. So as I said earlier, I'm not going to do a comprehensive look at every single effect, but I'll show you some and how they work, and then you can apply that knowledge to the others. First off, there are some effects that are pretty common across all systems, and some that are very specific to a system you're working on. For the purposes of this tutorial series, there are three categories that we care about. The general effects, the ones for the Genesis, and the ones for the Sega Master System. Today, specifically, we only care about the general ones and the ones for the Genesis. And all the ones we're looking at today will apply to the six FM channels of the Genesis. As for those four Sega Master System PSG channels, don't worry, we'll be looking at those eventually. Not in the next episode, but the one after that. So first, let's look at something that's sort of a quasi-effect, and that's volume. It's not really an effect per se, but it works in a similar way. Volume is always in the second column of the tracker for each channel. 
goes right next to the note name. For the Sega Genesis, the FM channels support volumes ranging from 0 to 7F in hex. In terms of decimal numbers, that ranges from 0 to 127. 7F is the equivalent of 127. Now that seems like a big range, but in terms of practical use, you're probably going to end up most often staying between volumes in the range of about 55 to 7F. I mean, once you start getting into volumes below 60, it's a little tough to hear anything, but you might find some use in the 40 to 50 range for things like echoes and fades. Also, you'll generally want to avoid blasting everything at volume 7F if you're working on music specifically for a game, because that'll make it drown out sound effects. If you're just doing music that's not intended to go into a game, well, that can be fine then. Well, sort of. There are some other problems that presents, but I'll talk about that uh, when we wrap things up towards the end of this series. Now, for volume and several other effects, here's a fun little tip. You don't have to put it right next to a note. You can manually put volume changes anywhere you want in that second column. So, for example, we can just blast 7F at the start of a note, and then a few rows down, make it 7-2. Then a few rows down from that, make it 6-C. You can put volume changes in any row, whether there's a note there or not. And guess what? That's pretty much all there is when it comes to volume itself. Which means it's time to move on to proper effects. Now, effects will all go into the fourth column of each channel and beyond. You can have several effects activate and work at the same time. Do you see the little plus signs up at the top of the columns? If you hit plus, that adds a new column, and you can add another effect. And you can do that two more times for a total of four effects that can be active in the same row at the same time. As you'd expect, when you click minus up at the top there, it deletes a column. For now, we're going to keep it simple and work with just one effects column. So here's a very simple effect to start with. Stereo panning. The way stereo works on the Genesis is that sound in each channel will either come out of both the left and right speakers at the same time, the left speaker only, or the right speaker only. There are no multi-level adjustments. It's all or nothing. Here's the effects list in the current version of Deflamask. Please note this is not available at all in the legacy version, but you can pull up the same thing by looking at the manual. So we're going to scroll down the general effects here until we get to effect 8. We see it listed as 8XX panning. Here we see an explanation of what the effect is and how it works. In the case of the Genesis, the way we apply this to the effects column is like this. We'll enter 08 in the first part of the column, and then the parameter goes into the second part. For both channels at once, we enter 11. So our total effect column will read 0811. And please note that both speakers is the default state of every channel, so you don't have to manually specify this for each channel. Now let's play a little tune here. And let's say we want to pan right for this channel. If we want to do that, we'll change that 1-1 to a 0-1. And play the song again. Okay, and then let's pan left instead. We'll change that to 1-0. Here's what that sounds like. Much like with volume adjustment, you can enter this in any row. It doesn't have to specifically accompany a note, which is true of most but not all effects. Anyway, let's delete that entire effect. Also, hey, let's relax those brains one last time with another little cat break. And, well... Here's a little cat. Again. Back to effects. Next, let's look at another common one, a volume slide. Or you may even consider this as a fade. If we open up the effects list, we can see that this one is effect AXY. Now the format is slightly different than the stereo effect we just looked at. If you look at the information, it tells you that X and Y do different things. So in this case, they are actually two completely separate digits. If X is greater than zero and Y is equal to zero, then volume will slide up, or fade in, or slowly get louder. 
If x is equal to 0 and y is greater than 0, then volume will slide down or fade out or get quieter as time goes on. If that sounds complicated, don't worry. I promise it isn't, and I'll show you. Let's take this little series of notes. We'll set the first one to volume 6, 0, and then add the effect 0a, 3, 0. In this case, that means that effect 0a is the volume slide. 3 is the x value, which means it will slide up by a factor of 3 per each row. The 0, which is y, means that this is a slide up. Now let's play it. Neat, right? Okay, let's do the reverse. So first, we'll make the volume on the note 7f. And then next, we'll do effect 0a, 03. This will mean that effect a, the x0, is a slide down, and the y equals 3 means by a factor of 3 per line. So let's play it. Hey, that's a nice fade out. Now let's change that 3 to a 7 and try again. Hear the faster fade? Kick it up another notch and change that 7 to a B. Remember, B in hex is the decimal number 11, so it'll fade by a factor of 11 per line. And that's that. One super important thing to mention about volume fades. When you're done with either your fade up or fade down, you have to do two things on the next note that plays after the fade. First, you need to set the volume of the instrument again, and then second, you need to turn the fade off. You turn the fade off by typing in effect 0a00, which indicates the volume slide effect with no slide up and no slide down. If you forget this, every time after you manually set a volume, It'll just keep on fading in whichever direction you last had set. Now let's take a look at a simpler, but equally important effect. Jumping or looping. If you want to make your songs seamlessly loop, there's an effect for that. If we pop open that effects list again, we can scroll down for a bit and see there's an effect BXX, which is called Position Jump. Now I'm going to cover looping in detail at the end of the series, because it's a bit of an in-depth thing, that will slow this tutorial down too much. But I'll give you the basics today. So we just enter the effect 0B into the effect column. Then to the right of that, we enter the pattern number that we want to jump to. Where do we get that? Well remember, we've got the pattern matrix in the upper left corner. And we can see all those numbers in the sequence in the first column. You enter the number in that column that represents the line to which you want to jump. So if I want to jump to, say, 0, 2 for my loop, that's what I enter here. And this isn't specifically a loop function. You can add the jump effect at all different places throughout your song if you want. But anyway, this is what it looks like when you play it. So that one's pretty easy, right? Let's take a look at a few more useful ones. Let's check out Vibrato. If we open the effects list, we can see that it's effect 4xy. And whenever you see a, a digit by itself, you always want a 0 to the left of it, so that'll be 0, 4. So in this case, x is the speed of the vibrato, and y is basically how hard it vibrates. x can be a digit ranging from 0 through f, which is 15. And same for y. So let's see this in action. Here's one of the string sounds I made. Let's add effect 0464. Hmm. Well, that sounds a tad more string-like, doesn't it? What if we go crazy and make it 04FF? Well, this happens. How about something else, like 2F? Well, then we get this. What if we reverse it and change it to F2? That results in this. As you can see, you can create a whole bunch of different effects. Keep in mind, to turn the vibrato off, you have to set the effect to 0400 at the point where you're done with it. 
One word of caution for this effect in particular. If you're exporting music to the VGM format to use for a game, this and some other effects write to the register every tick. What this means in human terms is that it makes your file sizes much bigger. I mean, you might go from a 40 kilobyte song to a 110 kilobyte song just from adding this effect to a channel or two. So if you're making music that you intend to put into a game, even though it doesn't sound as nice, you'll probably want to avoid this effect and instead use the coarser tools of the AMS and FMS settings in the instruments themselves. Okay, so let's just toss in one or two last ones here. Let's look at portamento. This is pitch sliding or bending. There are two separate effects for this. Well, actually there's more, but we're going to look at the two simplest ones. Portamento up and portamento down. There are actually different effects for each one of these. If we look at the list, we can see up is 1xx and down is 2xx. So you might be wondering, or have already figured out, the difference between xx and xy in the effects is described either in the program itself or in the manual. Let's briefly touch on that. xx means it's a single parameter and both digits form a single number. xy means there are two separate digits that, depending on the effect, can range from 0 through f, and they usually operate independently of each other in that case. So back to portamento. This is pretty simple. If you want to pitch bend your sound upward, use effect 01. The number you put next to the effect is how fast the pitch bend is per each tick or row. So here's an example of a slow portamento up. We'll set the effect 0102. We'll hit play and away it goes. Want to hear it slide faster? Let's change that effect to 013C. Now let's hear a portamento down. For portamento or pitch bend downward, we have to change the effect to 02. Let's try 0205. And away we go. Let's hear a faster slide. We'll change that 05 to 6A. Just like with the other effects we've looked at, you have to turn these off when you're done with them, using the appropriate 0100 or 0200. Let's look and listen to a quick example of making some adjustments. Alright, the final stop on our journey today is a peek at some Genesis-specific effects. Now these are a tad more complicated, so really I'm going to more summarize most than show you them in practice. For example, we have specific effects that let you change the TL, or total level, of each operator individually, so you can change the intensity of each operator on the fly. 12XX is operator 1, 13XX is operator 2, and so on. XX in this case is a single number from 00 to 7F. As with volume control, that 7F represents the number 127. So these are a little more advanced, but hey, if you want to, go ahead and mess around with them, see what you can do. Similarly, you can change the multiplier of operators on the fly. This can save you the hassle of having to create some extra instruments if you're creative with it. Now this effect is 16XY, so the effect is 16, the first digit is which operator you're going to change, and can range from 1 to 4. The second digit is what you want to change the multiplier to, and ranges from 0 through F for 0 through 15. Alright, we'll take a quick peek at two more of these specific effects, and then call it a day. The second one will lead directly into our next episode. Now the first thing we're going to look at is the LFO, or Low Frequency Oscillator, which I touched on briefly in a past episode. This will basically just affect how strong the vibrato and tremolo effects you use are. Now, when you're just starting out, I'd recommend not even using this effect and just leaving everything at the default while you're learning and doing your first few songs. But, hey, I'm not the boss of you, so here's how it works. The effect can be set in any channel, it doesn't matter which one you use, and it will affect all channels. The effect itself is 10xy. For x, you can use 0 or 1 or really any non-zero number. Zero is off, anything other than zero is on. Y actually controls the speed, and in this case can range from zero to seven, with seven being the fastest. Go experiment, knock yourself out.
All right, finally, in a preview for the next episode in the series, let's talk about the DAC, or Digital to Analog Converter. This is how you get sampled sound onto the Genesis. When you hear voices on the system, realistic sounding percussion, or even realistic sound effects, chances are you're hearing actual recorded audio or samples. Next time we'll go in depth on samples, but today I'll give you the very basics of how they work really quickly. So on the Genesis, the DAC only works on the 6th FM channel. You have to use an effect to turn the DAC on or off. You have to load in the samples you want to use, and you can have multiple samples in each song. Each sample gets assigned to one note of an octave. So in general, you can have 12. Deflamask allows you to have additional sample banks if you want. But samples are large, so if you intend to use your music in real games, you'll want to include as few as necessary. Now let's take a look at an example. I'll load in a bass drum and a snare. To use them, I go into FM channel 6. I enter the effect to turn the DAC on, which is 1701. If you want to turn it off and switch back to regular FM sound, you would change that to 1700. And really, that's all you need to know for how this one works. So let's go ahead and turn it on. All right, so I've got the bass drum on the note C and the snare on C sharp. Let's enter in a simple drum sequence. And, well, let's play it back. Neat. So next time, I'll tell you a whole lot more about the deck and how to create and edit your own samples and stuff like that. All right, folks, so let's go over what we covered today. First, we did a little more on FM instruments. Then I gave you an additional cheat sheet to help you with creating FM instruments. I talked about volume on the FM channels and how to set that, and then I covered a bunch of general effects that work on various systems. Finally, we wrapped things up by covering some Genesis-specific effects and the DAC and samples. Not bad for a day's work. Today's tutorial was probably the most difficult and demanding one in the series. So feel free to leave comments with any questions you have after watching any episode of this tutorial. That'll do it for this video, my retro gaming and chiptune loving friends. If you enjoyed the video, please toss it a like and share it. If you haven't yet, please subscribe and click the notification bell so you won't miss the next installment. I'll also note that if you don't click the bell now, you have less of a chance of being notified when the video comes out because YouTube is apparently burying my stuff for some reason. If you want to support my work, you can do that on Patreon or Ko-fi. With that, I'll say thanks for watching, and see me later.